Welcome to Buckets. My name is Matt Moore. I'm the senior NBA writer for the Action Network. I'm joined by NBA futures analyst and NFL masterpiece creator, Brandon <laughs> Anderson. Uh, if you have not checked it out, you can follow it on Twitter. You can go to actionnetwork.com or you can follow it in the app. Brandon has filed about 700,000 words on the NFL season. Um, he has best bets. He filed all of his best bets in the app. You can follow them in the Action Network app. Uh, if you're a pro subscriber, you get instant access to his picks as he puts them in. Um, there are so many exotics he's put in for the NFL season. Um, they're all really amazing. Uh, it's going to be a wild season following him on NFL. So make sure to check that out. Also make sure to check out youtube.com slash the action network. Uh, favorites podcast is on there with Simon and Chad. You've got the action network podcast with Brandon uh twice are you on two, two and a half times a week Three. yeah I, i'm on Three. i am on sunday nights on the recap pod that one's live so you can join us after the games or listen to it monday morning and then i will be on tuesdays evan abrams and i are rotating through doing the, the tuesday roundtable a new episode we're doing that will have uh simon hunter and chris raybon sean kern and other guys rotating through i think chad millman will be joining at times and then uh, Brandon Glashine and I are the Friday NFL Best Bets episode every week. So you catch me two, three times a week over there. Brandon also cost me money because I bet him that he couldn't actually do nine picks <laughs> in 25 minutes. And he got it done the one time that he actually managed to get him under on a podcast. Uh, so maybe that's you like You bet me that I couldn't get my three picks out in 25 minutes. I did yeah. nine picks um, in 27 minutes. I'm very yeah. proud. I'm pretty, I'm pretty mad about that. Uh, I feel, I feel like I got a bad beat on that one. Uh, <laughs> you can check out WNBA buckets as well on actionnetwork.com slash or youtube.com slash the action network and uh, WNBA playoffs coming. Uh, going to be a great, great run for, for those folks. Make sure to check out Maria and the crew over there as well. Today's episode is your Southwest division best bets episode wrapping up our division previews. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, Brandon is going into NFL mode, but Brandon will be back for the start of October. Brandon will have a weekly show on buckets where he's going to do futures conversation. He'll do, um, those kind of discussions. He'll have your Friday episodes throughout the season. Look for those starting in October, but there will be a break in the month of September from Brandon, but not from the rest of us, because I'm going to be having, I've already started doing this. We're doing a lot of cool stuff. So next week we're starting awards and what we're going to do is we're going to do a deep dive and then we're going to call we're going to do what I'm calling price finder and you'll have more details on that next week it's going to be a great exercise in helping you find value on all these different awards but this is the southwest division episode and we're probably going to go long cuz we have lots to talk about you got and, something and about? just to add in and. i will be doing awards so I, my awards will be back those are the first episodes i will be doing in october so the yeah. rest of the crew will do awards now my awards are coming don't worry they'll be there later yeah uh all right, this is going to settle in because this one's going to take a bit. Uh, let's start with, I know this is going to be yours, and I have, there's just like <laughs> lots to talk about it. Let's start with the Memphis Grizzlies. As always, we'll do 10 words about, what we're, uh, about where we're at with this team and then a bet lean pass. Give me your Memphis Grizzlies. Matt Moore. I am ready to get hurt again. Run it back. Over 46 and a half. It's a bet. Let's go Grizzlies. Let's do it again. Yeah, I wish I was with you on this. Um, I am. My 10 words are. I am not ready to get hurt again. I am a <laughs> wait for preseason. I'm a pass for right now. Uh, let's go ahead and go through the numbers. The Grizzlies have a win total of 46.7 in the market. That has actually, uh, surprising to me a little bit, there was a lower number that actually popped up a little bit, but this is ticked up. Uh, there are still 45 and a half in the market, but this is steaming a little bit towards 48. Uh, there's one 45 and a half in the market. It's moving towards, there's 47 and a half in the market. It's, by the time you listen to this, we're probably going to be at, at consensus 47 and a half because it's been moving pretty quickly over the last week. Um, so that's where the number is at. I've got them projected at 47.8. That's where I've got them at. So I have them just over this number, but I'm going to be really honest with you. This is the one projection that I just threw a dart at a board uh, because trying to figure out what this team is, is the entire question about him. 
because of the circumstances of last year. So Brandon, give me the big picture on the Memphis Grizzlies and where you're at in terms of like what you think about the big picture of Memphis. Yeah, I mean, obviously last year was the season from hell. If if ever there is a season from hell, the Memphis Grizzlies lived it. They got 15 games from Ja Morant and Brandon Clark and Steven Adams combined. That's what happened last year. They got 20 games of Marcus Smart and Derrick Rose. They got half a season from Desmond Bain and Luke Kennard. They got all sorts of minutes from dudes that we never heard of before, playing like 30 guys down the roster. So yeah, that's why it's impossible to project everything from last year is just like straight out the window. None of the numbers really mean anything, but but they really lost nothing of note. They lost Steven Adams, but he wasn't playing anyway last year. They're bringing everything good back, including they get back Brandon Clark, who was also not going to be playing last year. They get back, hopefully, a full season of John Morant, all as an injury risk, but we don't have the suspension this year. So if we liked the Grizzlies last year with less John Morant and no Brandon Clark, and they're bringing everyone else back for the most part, it's only logical. We have to like them again. Ja, Bain, and Jaron Jackson Jr. all aged 25 or 26. They're entering their prime. It feels like this Grizzlies thing has gone on a while. It has. This is just starting. Like, this is the beginning of the window still for this team. Before last year, the previous two Grizzlies seasons, they averaged number 10 offense, number three defense, 51 wins and 56 wins. This is a dominant team, at least in the regular season. We'll see about later. They also, of course, they got a bonus draft pick high in the draft because of the season from hell. They added Zach Eady, the most dominant player in college basketball of the century, probably so far, who looked awesome at summer league, who looks ready to make an impact right away. They needed a big man. They got a great one there, potentially. I think we have to compare, obviously, this team to previous years. But even there, it's still tricky because even in the really good years we just talked about, they still only got like 60 games from the Stars. And maybe that's all they'll ever get from this team. And maybe that's part of what we have to factor in. But I think that's important context. Two other notes. I still think there's another move here. They've got Luke Kennard back for $11 That's a good expiring contact on a deal. John Conchar is a good deal on a low number. There might be another deal here, and they might need to make a deal because, Matt, it's the Grizzlies. So it has already started. As of a couple of days ago, G.G. Jackson has started the flurry of injuries that will no doubt besiege my poor Grizzlies this year. And G.G. Jackson, what's the update on him? Do you know the, the latest? Three months. So he'll be back around probably sometime in December is when I would expect him back, depending okay. on conditioning. So yeah, well, there's this team hasn't really figured out the small forward thing yet. They tried with Zaire Williams. That did not work. They've tried, you know, Jake LaRavia. That did not work. It looked like they're figuring out Gigi Jackson. I wondered if he was going to start, and I was kind of hoping he wouldn't be. I thought he'd be much better off the bench. So now I kind of actually don't mind that they have to find a different version of the starting lineup without him, but definitely some scoring punch off the bench. They will miss without him. Maybe there's another move coming, but of course that is a difficult spot to come up with somebody out on the wing there. But that's the big picture. That's where things are at. I am effectively throwing out last season, which is why I have to be back in because I was in on this team at the start of last season, and now we're getting a discount on the number. So you've long been a Grizzlies guy. I know you are in on this team also generally. What do you like about the Grizzlies this season? I mean, I like the roster. I like the roster. Um, You know, Ja is obviously like at a low point right now in terms of public perception, but Ja came back and made like an immediate impact before the labor injury last year. There's no reason to think the labor injury is going to hold him up this year. Um, Marcus Smart, actually, like when Marcus Smart played, the impact numbers were very, very good. And so it kind of like, it leads towards the idea of, I asked yesterday on Twitter, um, who are going to be the top five defenses in the NBA next season? And there was a lot of debate about Memphis. And the reality is just like, look, they, they have so many plus defenders. They just have so many. Not only do they have a uh, former defensive player of the year, Jaron Jackson, 
Desmond Bain's a plus defender. Marcus Smart's a plus defender. Like up and down the roster, like they just have like a lot of guys. And like Jaw's not bad. Like Jaw's not a negative defender. He's not a plus. He's not somebody that you're gonna stick on like high profile guys. But Jaw's like more than able to hold his own for what he what he's asked to do. Um, he's that like the athleticism is obviously there. I love that uh, the coaching staff has put so much into fixing the half court offense. I like it when coaches very clearly and plainly identify what their weaknesses are and are realistic about them versus like a lot of coaches are just like, yeah, well, that's not really my problem. That's a roster thing. Or we'll figure that I'm not worried about that. It'll figure itself out. No, like you should actually look at what happened with your team and figure out what was the weakness and what do you need to solve? And Taylor Jenkins did that. He did. He tried to do it last year, but guess what? Everyone's pets, their pets heads fell off. So <clears throat> instead, you know, they've gone and they've had a new offensive coordinator for basically to help them figure out the half-court offense. Um, they have better shooting. I love the remake of the bench. I'm very, very happy that Zaire Williams, I hope that kid has a great career. I hope he has a fresh start. I'm very glad he's gone. Um, this second unit looks much, much better. Scotty Pippen Jr. had at, like looks like an NBA player. Like he's an actual impact guy. Uh, Vince, it, it, there's all these guys that look like they're going to be better contributors. So there's lots to like here, I think, in terms of on both sides of the ball. Like the like there is a very strong there is, you know, we always talk about the tails. To me, it's like the the Grizzlies tail end is among the best in the league, where you can get them for the number one overall seed at 50 to one in the market. And I don't know if I'm gonna bet that yet, but if you like Memphis, you should like them that much. That's like what, that's what you need to do because there's so many reasons to like them. I don't have a lot of like downside. I don't think that the floor for this team is like last year. Cause it was such an outlier in terms of what happened to them. Maybe, it, you know, maybe they have two years where that kind of injury stuff happens. I'm not somebody that goes like, well, this is what, I mean, this does bother me where we're like, well, they had really bad injury luck last year. That doesn't mean they're going to have good injury luck this year. No. It just means no, they won't have as bad injury prior. luck. Like, yeah. Good. Injuries carry over. If anything, bad injury luck implies more bad injury luck because your guys are going to get hurt again. If anything. Yeah. Um, I missed some of the other markets on this. So I do want to hit this really quickly. You can get their division price at two sixty is the best that I'm seeing in the market. Currently make miss playoffs. They are minus two thirty plus plus one eighty. I mentioned the 50 to one for the number one overall seed. You can get conference odds that are around 17 to one for them to be the one seed. Um, just kind of generally, I want to make a note on this before we get to what you like about them. This number, more than any other team, this number is wrong. They just don't know what to do with it. Like, this number is very plainly like, yeah, uh, really good team in the West. Like, they, they their number should be 50 and above because yeah. they were – a top three seed the previous two seasons. I am, we'll get to, to my concerns in a minute. So I'll hold off on that. What do you like about the Memphis Grizzlies? Yeah, yeah a, lot, a lot of the same stuff. I, I like that. I like that they had last year, honestly, for this team, because I think that what happened last year raises the floor for this year's team. Vince Williams is a dude. Vince Williams is a nasty defender. He's going to play real important minutes for them. Scotty Pippen Jr. I like Jalen Wells. Those guys, like if you're a summer league sicko like Matt and I are, like we watch them. They're a lot of fun. They, they were really good at summer league. Obviously, Gigi Jackson, once he is back as a scorer off the bench, that's a thing they've needed for a while. Last year, the Grizzlies played 33 guys. They had 17 players play at least 500 minutes, which which is crazy. Like, that's that's 20 minutes a game times 25 to get to that many. So they're just like rotating through guys. And remember, a lot of those 17 guys are not even the ones you wanted to play all those minutes. No Clark, no Jaw, no Adam. So if you're looking at minutes, if you do want to compare it to last year, here's the minutes equation. No more Zaire, no more David Roddy. 2,100 minutes, those are gone. 500 minutes less from like, Santi Aldama, Vince Williams, Gigi Jackson, John Contra, who are all there still, but are going to play less minutes and better roles for them. And probably, by my math, you're going to get somewhere around 6,000 extra minutes from Ja, Bain, Clark, Edie, and Smart. Effectively, the starting lineup or something close to it, uh, pretty close to that. So 
It's just a lot more minutes. It's That to me is why last year it doesn't really count toward the projections. I like the depth. I actually count on this team, including Gigi once he's back. I have 15 dudes on this team that I think are like legit rotation players that I want to find minutes for. Not huge minutes, not last year's minutes, but 15 guys. So to me, that, what happened last year, raised the floor because you found Gigi and Vince and Scotty and Jalen Wells. You found these guys that now are suitable to fill in when, sure, Ja misses a month because that's probably going to happen sometime. Now there's some options. Last year and the previous years, they didn't really have those options. So I like that. Taylor Jenkins, I love Taylor Jenkins. I think still one of the more underrated coaches in the NBA. This defense ranked 12th in the NBA last season. Build the man a statue. Like, they're sending guys off the street to play yeah. defense in a lost season that doesn't matter, and they finished above average. That's literally incredible. Like, the turnovers still were there. The team mentality as such was there. They were top six three times in a row before that. You know I love my defense as the high floor in a regular season. And then I have to say it, I know you did not like the pick. We've talked about this. I really like Zach Eady for this team. And I actually think Eady is a very like-for-like like Stephen Adams type replacement. I think if he works, he's going to set hard screens. I think he's going to score efficiently on the limited touches they get him. I think he's going to get offensive rebounds. That's a thing this team wants anyway. I think the things that Adams did well, Edie is going to give them some of those things. I don't know that that means I want him for rookie of the year, because if you look at Steven Adams' box scores, that's not a thing that we give awards to usually. But I think Steven Adams is a guy whose winning impact on this team was immense and missed last year, and maybe a thing that I overlooked a little bit coming into the season. Or maybe we, 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 that happened at the start of the year, so we didn't realize. I just think Edie can replace that and I think that uh, replace to an extent. And I think that's really important too. So it, it's just a lot. There's a lot of things to like. How's ED as a passer? <clears throat> I think pretty good. Like for a big man, you know, he's, he's yeah. not Jokic, but he's got, he's got a nice touch, nice pass. Like you certainly can pass out of the double team in the post. He did a lot of that at Purdue hit the, hit the open three point shooter. Okay, because like that's like a lot of it is like Ja and uh, Steve Stevo had like insane chemistry yeah. with pinch post. Adam's a better passer. like they would Adam's run give a really and good pass and, and, man. Yeah, and just and so like losing that's a little bit of my concern here. I sure. worry about the spacing um, on those kind of levels. I think he is going to be good. Like he is like a great screener. He does have a great touch inside. He is a physical beast. All these things are good. I worry a little bit about just like it's more. It's less a matter of like I don't need Edie to be. You can't ask ED to be different from what he is. And so the problem then is like Jaron's going to like Jaron is more flexible. So then Jaron needs to kind of be a little bit more stretchy. And I don't love that. Like he was 32% yeah. last season from three. Like I just don't know that Jaron's ever going to be a great shooter. Yeah. And so the space I, I, will add to, me there. I will add to that level. I wanted to say this with ED. I like what Edie's presence does for Jaron Jackson on the other end of the court. Jaron Jackson yeah. as a center was not yep. happening for them and his defense <clears throat> fell off. I agree. I don't like him as, as much offensively at the four, but I think he more than makes up for it defensively. I think we're getting a bounce back season from what he does for this team defensively. And it might be, it might just be that, that simple that um, the rate for top five defenses go over in the season, in which they are a top five defense it's like 90%. Like if you're a top five defense, you're going over. And so if you're just like, I think they will be a top five defense. That's enough to take the over here. Because again, I don't think the number is right. Um, that's what's frustrating. It's, and I don't know. <clears throat> My hesitation is quite honestly kind of built around that the unknown of I, I, with the way that I have covered teams, know that just, like, things change as people change. As players get older, the dynamic shifts. And, like, maybe it's evolved into a really healthy, good place because 
honestly, that team was a bunch of numb nuts two years ago and got themselves in over their heads and it got them buried by the Lakers on top of all the injury issues. Like having Brandon Clark is back is like a huge deal. Like Clark's came back last season and now like you get a full season with him. They're stacked. Um, the roster's really good. The coach is really good. The star power is really good. I'm just the 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 precept of they'll just go back to what they to as good as they were. Something about that is what trips me up with them. Where I'm like, yeah. I don't know if I believe that that's going to be like. I don't know if I think that that's how this works. I don't know if that's how what I think that the NBA or sports or life is like. Like this is a much more like ephemeral existential question with Memphis, which is why I've largely put them to the side and just been like, yeah, I don't know. Um, and it's like, but, but if we get into the, the basketball side of this, if we remove all that kind of stuff and you're like, let's talk about actually concrete stuff. The roster stacked, the coach is really good. They've got depth. They've got versatility. They have redundancy built in, which is, you know, they had to because they had to get so many guys last year. So now it's like, hey, if Marcus Smart's out, that's okay because they've got wings that can fill in. Hey, if Desmond Bain's out, Marcus Smart can fill in for him. Like, they have so much versatility in what they can do now, and they're still going to have Ja, who is completely overlooked right now and was, was an MVP candidate two years ago. So it's like all of the tangible stuff here – like I like Brandon's cap much better than mine, but <laughs> I have like very gut instincts of just kind of being like, man, for whatever reason, I am just being cautious with them. And I'm not sure why yeah. I don't know why I'm not all in. It's not because we lost last year. I'm willing to be like, no, we were right last year. Like, and they're even better now. Let's go back in. Like, it's not that I'm just, there's something about the unknown of what they were two years ago and trying to be that but different that makes me nervous. No, I think I, I think that's not nothing. Like I think that's a real thing. I do feel that feeling a little bit. Like if you just measure out what this team should be, as you were talking, you know, I was thinking about last year's Timberwolves and how does this team compare to last year's Timberwolves, a team that was in the one seed until the final final day or two of the season. This should be a similar team profile wise, right? They should be well. They're probably not going to be a number one with the bullet type defense, which Minnesota was, which that matters. Like that's a significant drop off. But if they are very good defensively, but like league average or slightly above average offensively, I think they can be better offensively than the Timberwolves were. I think right now, assuming John Morant is in there right now, I think John Morant is a better player offensively than Anthony Edwards is. We'll see where that ends up. I don't know that I think it will stay that way, but John has played like an MVP like actual top five ballot type player. Ant has not done that yet for a season. So I think from that perspective, that's what you like. What I don't like is I don't know that I quite believe in the ceiling here anymore the way I did going into last year because of the jaw factor, I think. That to me, if I had to like pick something about the team that I feel a little unsettled about, that I'm like not quite willing to go quite as hard last year, it's job because the defense is going to be there. The floor is going to be there. I think jaw is the ceiling on offense pretty clearly for this team. Desmond Bain was over his head and the role he had to do without jaw around last year. Like jaw needs to be what he is for all the rest of the dudes to be the right version of what they can be. Jaron Jackson was really not good last year. Offensively. He needed to do way too much. He just needs to do less. I think he can be better offensively this year doing less. Kind of like uh, Mikhail Bridges is a good example of like, get him into the role player-ish type role. And I like him better. But so much of that depends on Ja. And, and I mean, let's let's just be honest. It's not just that time has passed and last year is gone. Like John Morant, the man has had a lot of things happening in his life on and off a basketball court. And I don't know what that looks like anymore. I don't know how that plays out in a locker room. I don't know what that means for a team. And as a better, that's a real thing we have to consider. So offensively, they've topped out around like 115. That's not great anymore. And the way the league has gone, that's like a, an average offense. And I'm not sure that there is big offensive upside here compared to some of the other great teams in the league. So I think that that kind of hurts the ceiling for me. They still don't have that true wing. Like, I don't, I don't know who starts at the three. Is, is Marcus Smart starting? 
I'm not really sure what happens there. I kind of actually feel like the whole 15 players thing is like three guys too many. So knock on wood, I'd rather yeah. than not just get injured and that's the answer to it. But like you actually have to make a rotation at some point and figure out what's happening in here. But to me, the what I don't like is that that feeling of hesitation you have, I think is real. Mine is a lesser version, but mine is Ja Morant. I just think is MVP Jaw still in there? Is the athletic pop still in there? We saw that off of injuries and other stuff with guys like Derrick Rose, much bigger injuries, but like this was always going to be a type of player who was likely to peak early and maybe not last quite as long, right? Like whatever astronomy thing I go to, like a star that burns bright and then like dies out after that, that's the to sort of player that Jaw seems to be. And it, it's been a while and he wasn't that good last season compared to what he has been. And is that still there? Because for me to want ceiling outcomes, it has to be there. And I don't know if it does. So you are just, just like a flat over on the, the win total, no derivatives for you? I mean, you know, I got some derivatives. So let me, let me take a look here. We, I, I honestly, uh, I, I'm refreshing my memory a little bit because we, we prepped for this a couple of weeks ago and then the football and COVID happened in between. So um, we're catching up here. So I definitely like the flat over. Before last season, which counts, we lost a lot of money on it. Before last season, our man Taylor Jenkins was 4 0 to the over by 8.3 wins a season. They were under by 18.5 last year, so that kind of ruined the average now, but he was over by at least 6.5 wins every single season. So I definitely like the over. I got Memphis at offense 14th and defense number four, which is a net plus four in a 53 win team. You said this should be about 50. I think that's right. And I would still lean over and probably play a smaller amount. But I think we're kind of getting a bargain here because of the unknowns that are baked in. To me, this is a median play. So I don't okay. know that I need the super high-end outcomes. The number one overall, the 50 to one, I don't know if I can get there. Like, I don't know if I can see them. I don't know who it is. But some other team is going to have a higher ceiling season that plays out, I think. So maybe the one seed, 20 to 1, is the number that I'd seen of that. I see slight value on that. But uh, like, you know, we talked about uh, Phoenix as well. I can have slight value on both of those. I don't mind that, but I don't know they necessarily need it this year. The division, we're going to get to the other teams. I really don't know a lot about some of the teams in this division. And I think a bunch of them are pretty good. So yeah. I don't, I'm not super excited to invest in the division where I feel like things are changing a lot. I have the number at plus 310, and that's dropping also. So if I didn't really love it then, I have to like it less now that the number is moving. So yeah, I think, I don't think I have derivatives, actually. I, I noted all of them because I feel like I should. I think I just want to play probably multiple units just on the traditional over. I think I want to take some of the, the tail end plays. I think I'm going to go the opposite of you, where hmm. I worry about their medium outcomes for injuries and various other reasons, but I do want to get kind of get on the tail end 55 plus wins. You can get plus four fifty. That one protects you against if you're, if you, it, the conference title, the problem is like with how we've talked about these teams, there's a very, like there's a very strong possibility that Memphis wins 56 games and does not get the one seed. Like that's entirely possible. Now you'd have a hedge sure. opportunity late in the season at a much bigger number but those books don't always put the one seed in play late in the season. So you have to have the hedge opportunity or you'd right. have to hope that it comes down to a single game late in the, in the year. And that's asking for a lot. So 55 plus wins at plus 450, I think probably has a little bit of value there. Um, like I said, I'm going to see them in, in preseason. If they, if they look like, if they look like Memphis only upgraded, I'll be in. This is definitely a team that I want to see in preseason and kind of get a sense for what the offense looks like. And get a sense for whether or not this is going to be whether the vibe is the not even the vibe. I want to know if they look like they're connected. If they look like yeah. all right, everybody's on the same page and they're all ready to go. Cool, I'm in. Um, but I do want to go ahead and wait. But let uh, me let me ask you one more on Memphis. I did have the one other derivative here. We're we're doing a regular season. I believe Memphis is something like seventh to ninth priced in the West to come out of the West. If we think that this is a Timberwolves type team who I did not want really their postseason futures because I want the defensive teams in the regular season, not the postseason. But if we think they're in play for a top three seed, if you get like the two seed, 
You're you're likely to win your first round matchup. You're now one playoff matchup away from being in the conference finals. I had it at 20 to one was the ticket that I saw. If if we think this is a team that has a top three seed upside and they are priced as the seventh to ninth best team out of the West, it has to be value on that, right? Even if it's not a team I love in the postseason. Man. My initial kind of like thought is like a matchup concern because they were matchup dependent yeah. two years ago. But maybe they're not now. You know, Bain, Bain's yeah. development, better offensive system. Jaron's better offensively. They're more experienced. They're older. Like maybe they, you know, may, maybe they just are a different kind of beast. Maybe they're not as matchup vulnerable as they were two years ago. So, so let me ask um, it this way. So yeah, we've talked about did, like the, the hedging so. possibilities. Can you envision a mm-hmm. world where the Grizzlies made the Western finals and let's say that they don't have home court. So they're the underdog against fill in the blank, whoever you think it is, OKC, Denver, Phoenix, whoever you think it is, can you envision that world where we're sitting on our 20 to one now and we want to hedge out because we don't think they're going to win anymore. Are they close enough priced that we can actually profit off of that? Or are we just chasing here? If they make the conference finals, I don't like the, there's certainly the possibility of them being like five, being like the, the six, so this, a play in team and making a run. Cause apparently sure. that's a thing that happens now, but based off of like how we feel about this teams, if they make the conference finals, the, that series price is going to be less than minus 200. At that point, you've got a great hedge price of, at 20 to one. Right. Yeah. So like there's that, that's, it's definitely, this is where I'm, I am with you in trying to get off, peel back from all these like, hey, you can just hedge this later. You can't always hedge it later. It's not always a good idea to. This does, though, seem like a number where very specifically you can take that kind of outcome and, ha- and be in a very good position. I cannot see a scenario in which even at like, let's say OKC wins 65 games and they make the conference finals. I still don't see them being minus 250 versus Memphis in a conference finals. I just don't see it. So, um, yeah, I think I think it's probably a very good spot to be able to be like, I'm just banking on them winning two rounds with a hedge opportunity. I, I agree with your, with the cap there. Um, by the way, I did want to mention this one just because I think it's a pretty good price here for the median outcome. How about this one? Uh, they're seeding under mm. six and a half. So for them to be a top six seed is plus 100, even money, no juice. Oh. So that to me is like that. That covers a wide range of outcomes here where we're just basically like, look, they're not going to be in that in the play in tournament. They might be the one seed. They might be the four seed. They might be the five. They might be the six, but they're going to be a top six seed. Like they could win 46 games, go one game under and still wind up with the six seed here. I think that number on Memphis. Go ahead. Or they could win 49 games like the New Orleans Pelicans did last year and not be a top six seed and have gone over and not cash the bet. And that's my sure. concern because yeah. the West is so loaded that we yeah. had the uh, Mavs at 50, Suns 49, Pelicans 49 as yeah. the sixth and seven seed. The Lakers 47 yeah, seed right. go over this number and still hit yeah. the eighth seed. So yeah. I, it's, I like the idea. It's sharp. But to me, all these other West teams that we're uncertain about in the middle, we're suddenly putting them into this equation now. And I feel like I'd rather just play Memphis. Yeah. yeah, Here's, here's a better one. If I guess that's a good way to think about it. If you're just like, how many, how many games do you have to win in order to be a top six seed? It's like, you don't definitely have to win 50, but if you win 50, you're probably a top six seed. 50 plus wins is plus 125. You're getting getting the extra quarter on them. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Let's go ahead. And so for Brandon, that's a bet on the over. I am a pass until preseason. Uh, let's go to the Dallas Mavericks, who the defending Western Conference champion, Dallas Mavericks, lots of moves for them. Uh, Derek Jones is out. Josh Green is out. A little guy named Clay Thompson joins the squad along with Najee Marshall. Lots of lots of uh, positive buzz about their offseason. Give me your 10 words on the Dallas Mavericks and your bet leaner pass. Sorry, I'm still not sold on that entire finals run. Under 50 and a half on a lean, but I've got a different way to play it that we'll get to. Okay. Giddy up. Over. Three unit play, 50 and a half. Division plus 110. And a small play at 55 uh, or or more. 
uh, as well as under four and a half on seating plus 105. Wow. Wait, wait, to, to be clear, are those all your plays? And was your 10 words giddy up? My 10 words were giddy up. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. Uh, all right. So the numbers here, win totals 50 and a half. Um, I project them at 54.5 right now with a, with that's with a little bit of suppression that I put in that I'm not entirely sold on. Uh, if you're looking for uh, 55 plus wins in the market, there is a plus 260 uh, division odds. There was a plus 110. I believe that's still the best number in the market because they've taken a little bit of steam um, as this has gone on. There's a plus 115 as well in the market for the for the division price. Uh, Number one seed in the Western Conference, seven to one is the number that I've got there. Um, tell me a little bit about the Dallas Mavericks and the big picture on what you've got for them. Yeah, I think we I think we pretty well know the big picture on this team. It's a team we've seen a lot of. So obviously they had the finals run. They finished 24 and nine. They were top seven offense and defense during that stretch. They were number four in net rating. It all came together. We were skeptical. Was it real? Would it work in the playoffs? I don't know. I'm not sure if we necessarily got that answered. We got a lot of things bounce their direction in the playoffs. They made it to the finals. They get credit for beating the teams in front of them the way that they did. They got a big leap defensively with Gafford and PGA Washington. Obviously they get more of those guys now because they only joined mid season and obviously clay Thompson for all the things that I have to say about clay Thompson three years, 50 million. It's a pretty good deal for a valuable player. Like I, I think that he is not what people think he is but I think you should have kept him in Golden State for three years and $50 million. I think that's a pretty valuable add, especially on this team. Just catching rhythm threes from a man named Luka Doncic all day. That sounds like a pretty good life for Klay Thompson. My concern for this team on the big picture level, Kyrie Irving is on effectively an expiring deal. He's got a player option next year. He's a guy that's going to opt out and get the contract. Luka Doncic has two years until his player option. They don't have any draft picks coming up. They traded everything. Everything seems great right now. You love life in Dallas. It's still Kyrie. And there still is a season removed from missing the entire play-in postseason altogether. Like, if things kind of start to go sour, and I'm sorry, but Kyrie's teams tend to have a way of doing that, it could go sour quickly. And it could be like, it still is Kyrie and Luka. I think this is a top-heavy team, and this is not necessarily a long-term plan with some security. And until last year, until the playoff run, that's the thing we are focused on. I think that is a thing that could be kind of hanging in the background if things don't go as well as you hope that they do. And I'm a little worried about that side of things. Okay, so my cap is entirely outside of the playoff run last year. Okay, so what, part of what I'm hearing from you is like, I'm not sure that they're as good as they looked during that finals run. And I absolutely agree with you. Um, I nailed this team from the conference finals on. We made a lot on taking them versus the Wolves. We made a lot on fading them versus the Celtics, right? Like I, under, I, I thought it was a coin flip versus OKC. I will hold on to that. I think it was a coin flip series. They got past it. And then I love them versus versus Minnesota and I hated them versus the Celtics. And both of those panned out perfectly. I don't think that they are. I think it was a little bit of a fluky conference finals run. No, that's not, that's not accurate. It was absolutely a fluky conference finals run. <laughs> that doesn't change the fact of like what this team is from a regular season perspective, the changes that they've made and what the profile is. Um, the numbers here for, if we look at Dallas last year, and we kind of take these the additions and negatives, the additions and subtractions, I have a hard time finding any sort of way to, to not take back the over on this. Um, and the reason for that is, let, let's look at some of the profile stuff here. Um, last season, they went 25-5 and five versus teams under 500, Brandon. That's including 10-0 and 0 versus the, our favorite, the Southeast Division, and 11-5 <laughs> and 5 versus the Southwest. Now, the Southwest is going to be better this year with Memphis back, San Antonio improved and Houston's internal improvement. But still, they win their division games, they win their home games, they win their games versus teams under 500. That as a baseline for a team returning a lot of the same core, not the entire, but the, a lot of the same core, is really positive. This is the big one for me. 
is that when you look at last year, the Mavericks fans got in my grill about Luka Doncic and the injuries saying, well, if they'd been healthy, he would be MVP. And I kept responding. Yeah, but they weren't, but he would have been, but he, he wasn't. And this is, I, I will maintain this. You have to have a lot of luck to win MVP. Like this is just how it goes. You have to have your team be fortunate. You got to win coin flip games. If you have a year where you just like are snake bit on buzzer beaters, you're probably not winning MVP because you're not winning enough games. I'm sorry. Shit happens. Life <laughs> sucks. Get a helmet. But the problem with that is that they are right that it you can't apply context and describe them that way. In that, and this is like this is like such a huge thing. When Derek Lively and Luka Doncic played, they went 34 and 17, a 55 game win pace. This is like everything to me. When Lively and Luka played together, they won at 55 pace and they've improved the roster. So ins and outs based off of my metrics, they got 1.2 better on power rating with the additions and they got 1.1 better by the subtractions. So like I have this as like a huge advantage of 2.3 on power rating. That's a number of wins. Like that's a big bump just from that because Josh Green graded out as a negative last year. Tim Hardaway graded out as a negative last year. And Derek Jones Jr. was only a slight positive, which kind of matches things. Clay Thompson, for all of his foibles, still a positive player at a plus 1.1 on my power rating adjustment. Um, Spencer Dinwiddie, sneaky, going to help them because it gives you a backup point guard that you can actually play. Najee Margie, M- Marshall, Quentin Grimes, all of these guys. They are better. They have better shooters around them. They have better weapons around them. Luka Doncic, in my MVP d- discussion of him last year, um, Nikola Jokic is quoted as saying he's a one-man army, and it really is true. Luka is going to be is an absolute if, – if you were to give me any number on Luka Doncic to finish top three in MVP voting, I don't know, care what the juice is. I would bet it. There is no, no, there is no number I would not bet. Minus 10,000. I'll do one of those stupid bets. I would still bet it. Luka's going to be top three in MVP. They're going to win a ton of games. They do have a model that works. You mentioned Kyrie. Honestly, you look, I no one, no, I don't think many people in the industry have been as critical of Kyrie's nonsense as I have been. I've ranted and raved. However, here's a key, key thing. He's in Texas. No one, no one bothers him with that stuff. He's in an environment where he does not get antagonized. Even if he posts something on social media, no one asks him about it. There's no cause for controversy because of the environment that he's in. And he knows that if he just keeps his head down, that this Mavericks team who just paid Jason Kidd, who like is obviously invested in this core and has to, will pay him all of the money on one last big contract. So I'm actually, I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm not worried about Kyrie Irving. So those are all the things I like. What do you like about Dallas? Man, we we got like some drops in there. We got to get the I'm not worried about Kyrie Irving as a drop. And uh, I forget the mm-hmm. one you had just a minute or two ago. But like, we're we're going to be hearing some of these lines again. By the way, I, I'd love to book you on the ten uh, the minus 10,000 Luka top three. I'll, I'll take your action on that one. Uh, I'm going to do what I like and don't like together. What I like is Luka and Kyrie. Kyrie, I think, is actually underrated as a basketball player now. He is... Not underrated as a human being, but on the court, he's doing really good stuff. And I think actually, like all NBA caliber, and maybe we give him a little less credit than we should, Luke, I think, is coming off his best season. Particularly, his three-point volume and percentage was up. And that's a thing we have long wanted from him. And it has come and gone. And it came and stayed last year. So if that is real, I think I was a little worried that he had topped out. And topped out is already really good. But he took a little bit of a mini extra step next year, a half step forward. So that matters. I've talked before about Gafford and Lively. I've wondered if that is their third star, the two of them, the Gaffley combo, especially with Luca. Daniel Gafford last year had on this team 145 offensive rating on 77% true shooting, which is like absurd video game type production. Um, offensively, they have been top 10 in four or five uh, for the last five years. And I think the offense gets better. You add clay, you get the spacing. I agree. I think Dinwiddie on this team as the backup point guard has been a good fit. We've seen it. We have seen him be a good fit in the role on this team. So I like that. I think we get more Gaffley. 
I don't know about the defense. The defense has been 18th or worse in four of the last five years. The defensive leap last year was mostly EFG by the numbers. And if you look, offensively, they could get better by addition by subtraction. D- uh, Derek Jones, Josh Green, Tim Hardaway, those guys hurt the offense last year. Derek Jones, Josh Green, Grant Williams, those guys help the defense. Those are defensive first players that are being replaced by not defensive first players. So I, I don't, I'm not feeling great about the defense on the team. And my biggest concern is a thing I mentioned earlier. I think that we think this is a really good team now because we just watched the finals run. I think this is a really good pair. I think this is an elite pair of star teammates and a fine roster. And I will say this, I thought I'd be fading the Mavs pretty hard after the postseason. I like the offseason. I like the guys you're mentioning. I think that they made the team better. I wanted to fade them harder. But Luka and Kyrie have not been guys that have great health history. They just both had long playoff runs. Health can really only go down from what they gave last year. By the numbers, like we got Max, Luka, and Kyrie. And Luka's floor so far, Luka's team so far, have been high floor But we haven't had that great regular season ceiling yet from his teams. So it kind of all balances out to me. And I don't really, I'm not really out on the Mavericks necessarily. I just think that there are teams in the West I feel better about. I have them number six offense, number 17 defense. I think that's pretty fair. That's like what the Mavericks have been. That just puts them as like a 47 win team. And the number here. I think they got the Grizzlies number and the Grizzlies got the Mavs number. I think the books swapped them and should have switched the other way. Memphis or uh, sorry, Dallas has won anywhere from 47 to 52 wins in four of the last five seasons. That's what they are. That's what Luca is, is a borderline 50 win team. It's very, very good. I just don't like the number because of that. I get it. Um, for me, a lot of it is their their strength last year in closing the season and winning all those games late was because of that defensive identity. And I, I've talked a lot about how I'm still kind of like, really, Daniel Gafford, really? That's that's the, <laughs> the secret. That's the 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 straw that stirs the defensive drink. Really, it, isn't it funny um, how many teams got a stray Washington Wizard and then immediately made a huge leap forward? Like all the Wizards went to. The, the, the diaspora of Wizards went one to each team, and then they all went on long postseason runs. It's great. And there's Kyle Kuzma just sitting there counting his money. Um, Kuzma the, had you know, his down, down, He already did his at the Lakers. Right. The, the downside on, on, on this is the chemistry aspect, which is like defensive, defensive stuff, especially with how Dallas played, was built off of chemistry and effort. And it's hard to maintain that over 82 games. And if that changes with the new guys, like this is a lot of my thing with Derrick Jones Jr. versus Najee Marshall. Like Najee Marshall is a more impactful, more versatile, better player than Derrick Jones Jr. If we look at him from a number of perspective, DJJ gave them like a real sense of physicality and toughness. And Najee's not the same type of player. He's a better player, but he's not the same type of player. And so like that perspective, I think is, is like, Okay, if they lose that identity, what does that look like? But where I, I kind of come back to on this, not to, to, to take the negatives and the positives, but the reason I'm not as worried about it is because I am kind of like, look, if the defense is as good as last year and the offense is better just by the presence of better shooting, this goes over. If the defense takes a step backwards or just regresses back to what it was for the whole season, because they finished 18th and schedule adjusted, if it just if it regresses back and it's like no 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 Luke, Luke and Kyrie are still trash defenders we know this that that I think is pretty expected but the offense pops back up to number one I don't expect this defense to be bottom to bottom ten because they do have size physicality athleticism and good rim protection now like a lot of this is just like they finally put a rim roller who can actually protect the rim next to Luka Doncic and it's just like miracle upon miracles. It fixes so much stuff because even if Luka and Kyrie get blown by, you've got second level protection defensively. And on the other end, it always means that there's somebody who's got to be worried about the lob, which makes it easier on Luka. Um, I'm a little bit worried about Luka's three point variance. Like last year, he shot absurdly well for in, from three point range and that tailed off versus the playoffs. I think Luka, much like LeBron, is going to be an inconsistent three point shooter. And if, his, if that changes, that's going to shift you know, MVP stuff as well the numbers, the efficiency, all of that. If he goes back to being just like an absolute tank whose jumper's a little inconsistent, well, that's a problem. However, again, 
he's got so many shooters he can kick to, especially with Clay Thompson now. <clears throat> I think there's a very strong possibility the defense does take a little bit of a step backwards because Clay's so cooked. You know, Clay Thompson is washed. And now it's like you got to protect Luca, Kyrie, and Clay Thompson defensively. And Mavs fans will be like, well, you didn't have to protect him in the playoffs. Yeah, because those guys were able to level up in the playoffs and give that kind of effort in the very specific matchups that they faced. Over the course of A2 seasons, that's going to be a lot harder this year. Um, and so I think that is going to be a little bit of a problem. It was like they're going to have to protect for it. But also, um, and so that's like one of the negative things. I didn't kind of mention this. I didn't want to say this because you kind of talked about it. This is probably the, this is, this is, this is, this is the best roster of the Luka Doncic era. There has not been a better roster than this. Like when I look at this, and I go, okay, Kyra, Kyrie, Luka, Clay Thompson, PJ Washington, and Lively, your starting five. All really good players. From the front court perspective, you've got Kleba, Omax, and I actually like AJ Lawson quite a bit for depth. Um, you have Dimwitty, Hardy, Exum, Najee, Dwight Powell, and Gafford. Like the the versatility and redundancy they've got built into this roster helps a lot with the injury stuff as well. Um, and the fact that they do have two stars. So like if they're going to a game and Luke is out, you still have Kyrie Kyrie Irving and Clay Thompson. That's not going to get you past the Nuggets, and it's not going to get you past the Suns. But it's probably going to get you past, like, the Hornets. It's probably going to get you past, like, the Raptors. Like, they'll still have a, have a talent advantage more nights than not. So uh, some of the stuff I like on the positive side, but the defensive stuff I do think is kind of negative. Um, what else you got on this team? Yeah, I, I'm a little more skeptical, I think, than you on the offensive ceiling. Like, I, I compare it this way. Like, we've done the Luka and James Harden comparison for so long. And there was a long period where if you just had James Harden and played Harden ball, you could be the number one offense. Yeah. Like, that alone was a number one offensive ceiling. Yeah. And I don't think that the Harden ball ceiling has improved while the rest of the league's offense has improved. So I think that the Luka version of the Harden ball offense is not necessarily the number one ceiling anymore. So I think that's a little bit of where I'm missing... And then to me, uh, for, from where I'm playing them, I mentioned that I would lean under to play differently. So here's how this sets up for me. We've done all these teams now. I've got the Grizzlies, Suns, and Thunder in a tier at the top of the West. Those are my three potential one seeds. Then I've got Denver, who I definitely feel better about the floor with than, than Dallas because Jokic better than Luka. And I've got the Timberwolves and the Warriors. Now, I know we disagree on, on the Warriors, but that's a six. That is 49 wins and up. I've got Dallas at 47, 48 wins, and another team we're going to get to here still here. That's the seven seed. I have Dallas as the seven seed. So my bet for Dallas is not the under. I think if they go under 50 and a half, you're in range to make the play in plus 275 for the play in. That's the bet that I want on this team. Now, admit we just did this with the Grizzlies. They might win 48, 49, 50. They might cash the under, but escape the play in. But to me, I'm betting on the play-in number being pretty high. Remember, 49 missed a play, or 49 got you in the play-in last year. So this to me is a slight fade of Dallas and a slight bet on the West. And I, I just I think they are the fourth to eighth seed in the West. I'm not even really fading them that much. Hmm. I just think that the ceiling isn't quite where you have it, and the West is pretty strong, and that's gonna where I end up with them. Okay, uh, so I'm all in on the on the Mavericks. Uh, Brandon's a slight under, small underplay on the fifty and a half, and no, this will be okay, a fun I'm one for under. I'm just playing the play in odds plus two seventy five. Sorry, I was taking off your first first thing you said. So yeah, play in plus three seventy five. Uh, all right, let's go to the San Antonio Spurs. <sighs> oh boy, oh boy, the San Antonio Spurs team. Uh, give me your ten words. And your bet lean pass on the Spurs. Wemby is already so, so much better than you think. Over 35 and a half, multiple units. My favorite over of the season. The Spurs escalator season. Oh boy, do I have derivatives for you. They're coming. This is really funny because Brandon was probably the most outspoken skeptic of Victor Weminyama going into last season. With the idea of just, <laughs> which I think it was like reasonable to be like, there's no way he's going to be as good as the hype. And then Brandon came in at midseason and was like, oh my God, he's better than the hype. 
and it was just like really incredible to to, to kind of watch. I, I will say too, we we joke about my coming and going during the football season, which I'll be a little more present this year. One yeah. the one guy that I did not do that with last year was Wembenyama because I was like, I got to find out like what's happening with this yeah. guy. So I got to like take the the roller coaster and I got to see the progression. And I think that's I think it's important actually to me that I saw where he started and where it came every like month yeah. or so. And I'd be like, all right, let's get another check in. <laughs> oh, we've made another leap now. Yeah. So that's me. What are your 10 words and where are you at on the team? How the hell do I project Wembenyama? <laughs> And mine is a no play for now. Uh, I'm going to pass on the Spurs for right now. In the market, 36.1. There's been some movement on the over. It's up 0.9. So this one's going to get steamed because I think everybody's in the same spot as Brandon. Uh, there's still some 35 and a half in the market that I saw last time I checked. So if uh, you are interested in the over, make sure you use that as kind of a baseline that you should be shopping to make sure that there's not a 35 and a half left in the market. Uh, some other lines to kind of keep an eye out for with the San Antonio Spurs. Their seeding number is 12 and a half with the under minus 150 over plus 125 for the playoffs. I am looking at their uh, figure on that. Um, the San Antonio Spurs to make the playoffs, to actually make it to the playoffs and not just the uh, play in tournament. Eee. Yes, plus 380. No, minus 525. So that kind of gives you an idea where the, the market is at on them. Uh, okay, give me the big picture on San Antonio and give me what you like so much about the Spurs team. Yeah, so the big picture is 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 Wemby. Wemby is the big picture. Wemby is real and he is spectacular. We've seen it in the NBA. We saw it in the Olympics. We saw Team France nearly take down the juggernaut Team USA. Wemby was a huge part of what Team France did so well. And importantly, it's not just him anymore. They brought in Chris Paul and Harrison Barnes, who I think are the adults in the room for this team. I think they're going to add a lot of veteran leadership. They're going to just round out the roster and frankly, like give some baseline minutes to a team that needed guys like that. They also bring in Steph Castle uh, from the draft. We will see how that goes. I think that will be interesting. But interesting bringing him in with CP3. So presumably a slightly smaller role and a little bit less lead handling, which is a key for me on the read here. Last season, if you look at the numbers, after the All-Star break, the Spurs were 11-16. and 16. Now that's not a playoff team. That is a 37-win pace. But that's a pace that's already ahead of this number. And that pace, I think, mirrored the Wamanyama leap. Like if you see... How did the Spurs net rating go or how did their record go on the season? Every slice of the season you choose directly correlates with Wembenyama's slice of the season also. Early in the season, they were terrible because he wasn't good yet. And then like November, December, they were starting to get kind of good and it went from there. So let me get into that a little bit. Wembenyama, I think he had the first 15 games that were pretty inefficient. Then we got to like mid-November and, and he made a leap to where I'm going to, I got to use box plus minus. These are the numbers I got. So he made a leap to like two to three. It's pretty good. Pretty good for a rookie. Certainly I would have thought that was his peak as a rookie. Nope. He got to December and leapt to seven or eight box plus minus. That is a beyond an all-star. That's like a borderline MVP possible type candidate. And he still went up from there. In fact, over the last couple of months of the season, I can't figure out how to measure this. I, I'm a basketball reference representative or whatever my title is. Like I should be able to figure this number out. I think he had a defensive box plus minus of something like five to seven, which is an absurd number. The very best players in the NBA, like historically get to like two or three. He legitimately had like an off the charts BPM. That's what's driving it. The offense I agree is not that great yet. He finished the season at 10% block rate, an absurd number for a rookie. He was great on defensive rebounding. I did not expect that already with, with his frame. He was great assisting. He improved at that over the season, his creation. January forward, and don't forget, he turned 20 on January 4th. So basically, once he turned 20, he was up to 107 offensive rating. Still not great. Got a long ways to go. But January forward, 3.9 BPM, or sorry, 3.9 blocks per game. And he, from January forward for the rest of the season, was top five in BPM 
in the NBA. Matt, I made a post this summer about Wembenyama's already better than you think. He's already a top five player in the NBA, and it like blew up, and people thought I was crazy. And I'm the reason the NBA sucks and it's terrible. We can't let these guys just get to where they're going to be good later. He's fine. He's a top 25 player. He'll be like, I, I can't believe I get to be on the Wembenyama's really, really good, you guys, corner. Like, that somehow is happening. After the All-Star break, he made another leap to 8.2 BPM, four and a half blocks a game, 23, 12, and five. If the season started January forward and I had a vote, he would have made my five-man MVP ballot. On this terrible Spurs team, that's how good that he was. So the defense, I think straight up, and you know I am not a person to exaggerate, Weminyama alone makes the Spurs a threat to be the number one defense. Genuinely, I think that they went from a 119 defensive rating in 2023 to a 113.4 when the calendar changed, when he made his leap. They also, because they're the Spurs, they rebound well, they don't foul. CP3 is going to help with those things. So I like that. I like adding in CP3 and Barnes, probably 3,500-ish minutes in place of Zach Collins, Blake Wesley, Malachi Branham, guys that are not great, guys that whose minutes are not helping the team um, defensively. Past All-Star break, they leapt from number 23 defensive rating to number 12. EFG went from 28th, third worst in the NBA, to 13th, above average, because Wembenyama was doing that sort of stuff. Before the season, or before the All-Star break, they were a minus 8.5 net rating. That's an 18-win team. If you go just from 2023, they were a 9-win pace team. They were a minus 11.7. So to go from that to minus 1.6 is a huge leap. And he's going to keep getting better. He's still figuring stuff out and we're adding CP and we're adding Harrison Barnes. I have some ideas of how to project this team. I'm going to stop talking because I just said a lot of things. Those are the things I like. I want to talk about the projecting, but what do you like about the Spurs? Yeah. So <clears throat> kind of partial to my 10 words is just like, I don't, I don't know. I, I, you, you, <laughs> I'm interested to hear how you're going to project them. I don't know what to do with, with Victor. I don't know because so even in the Olympics, you kind of saw this where it would be like, he would have possessions where he looks like lost and out of control. And then he would have these sequences where he's the most dominant force on the, on the court for long stretches of time. And like, even when he doesn't know what he's doing, he's so hugely impactful and it's absolutely wild. And I don't know on when I'm doing these power ratings, which determine that the, that's the core of all my projections on some level, I have to kind of do a, all right, how much do I think that they're going to improve by on a power rating um, basis on internal improvement on guys getting better? I don't know what to do with him. Like right now, I'll tell you, I've improved them by about three and a half points. That's a massive thing for basically oh one much. dude. <laughs> and I still am kind of like, is that enough? Should I go higher than that? It feels like I should go higher than that. Because, like, that's how absolutely insane he is. Um, we've talked a lot about Victor. I will say that there's other parts of this team that I really like. Um, a big part of it is their overall numbers last year are not going to be indicative of almost anything because for the first half of the year, they wanted to, one, they wanted to develop uh, Sohan as a playmaker, and two, they wanted to see we they want to ease victor into playing center and then after the half point of the year they started playing a point guard and move victor to center and then all of a sudden it's like man and everyone's like final i was the the conversation was really obnoxious to me because it was like it was. everyone was like finally gosh what took you so long and i'm like do you guys really not think that pop knew this like do you really think the pop like didn't know? like <laughs> there was a plan they were following the plan they also followed the plan so that they could get a top four pick and get Castle. That's what they did. It all worked out. Um, I really liked what I saw from Sohan last year. I thought that he really, like, the playmate, he's not a point guard under any circumstances. But when you put him in that role, he got so much better at understanding how to make reads. It's going to be hugely impactful for him. And he is a voracious rebounder and defender. And that's going to be really good. Devin Vassell had a really sneaky good season. He was actually sneaky really good last year. Um, lots to like about what he brings to the table. Castle is obviously a huge boost there. They had two NBA players and Chris Paul 
and Harrison Barnes. Those guys are going to help just from a simple operation standpoint. I don't have them as like a huge advantage. It kind of sucks because like if you took the first half of Chris Paul's season and that player, this is like a major bump. But like he had to play on that crappy Warriors, not crappy, that underwhelming Warriors team over the back half of the year. And he got tired and was having to play a lot of minutes. And that kind of caught up with him a little bit. Um, honestly, Devontae Graham was one of the most hugely like negative impact players in the league last year. So getting rid of him um, moves him up a little bit. I love Devontae. Want good things for him. Hope he has a great career. Was not a good fit there. And they kind of struggled. They moved on from Chetty Osman. I think that's a really good move as well. Like they actually have a roster here that makes a lot of sense. Um, they didn't play him with a with Victor with a point guard for half of the season last year. And so now it's like, what are you doing now? Oh, we're playing with him with, with Chris Paul and Castle. So you get athleticism and defense and lobs all the time. How about that? Uh, <laughs> that's going to help a lot. Shooting still going to be an, be an issue, but I mean, look, I get it from the defensive standpoint. They should be absolutely voracious. They should be absolutely terrifying and things should be a lot easier for Victor. It shouldn't be as much of, if you watch them, so many of their possessions, not just for Victor, but for the entire team, were just like, uh, try some stuff. Like, Pop was letting them figure it out. Like, figure out how to be NBA players. They'll have a system. They'll have a design. They'll have structure this year. And that's going to help a lot on the offensive end, which is where they need the most help Help here. But also, I think you're right on the defensive end, um, the upside being considerable there. Are there things you don't like about the Spurs? Yeah, I mean, the offense, obviously. The offense is not going to be great, I think, this year. I, I think they're pretty well stuck in the bottom 10 right now. Unless Wamanyama makes another leap, he certainly could. He's probably going to get there eventually. But certainly that is the area that he still needs to get some help. Better point guards are going to help him. Uh, CP3 is the floor raiser some offensively. Obviously, historically, he's been an elite floor raiser offensively, but he's not that anymore. He's some. He can be some of that, certainly compared to what they've had. I don't like that you're really betting on health here on those two guys. Like you, you really need CP in this team, I think. And you obviously really need Wemby. And one of my big concerns going the last season was that I didn't know how the body would hold up. And so far there's no concern about that at all. He's been great. So awesome. I want to watch 15 more years of Wemby doing all the stuff that we get, please stay healthy. But there is reason to still believe like a guy at his size and body type, there's reason to be skeptical there a little bit. So the, the health concerns to the the stars star really in the offense, like if your offense really is bottom 10, your ceiling is capped. Like you can only be so good at that point, no matter how good your defense is. So I mentioned, I've got a couple ideas how to project them. Let me run through two different versions. The first one I'm just going to tell you right now is blasphemy. I'm going to say some names here. They're going to sound like blasphemy. I'm sorry, it's what I'm doing here. So, last season, from January forward, Victor Womanyama was a 7-plus BPM guy. He increased on that late in the season. But from January to the end, like since he turned 20, a big chunk of games, he's over 7, box plus minus. Basically, he's a top 10 player by that number. So, he gets there a little differently because it's mostly defense. I wanted to know, in NBA history... Who are the teams that I can find <clears throat> that have a legit superstar, a clear top 10 player, a probably budding super duper star who is a 7 BPM player but does not get any help? That has zeros for teammates. Now, importantly, not negatives for teammates, just not much help, which is kind of what I'm giving the Spurs roster for. What do, I, what do I do if I have a replacement level roster with one superstar? Here's the names that I found. Here's the blasphemy. Now look, first one was real easy for me. I spent my entire childhood and college years growing up watching Kevin Garnett on the Timberwolves. That's a great example of this. Kevin Garnett on the Timberwolves often had a pretty good point guard. It's a pretty good comp here because they got a pretty good point guard in CP. Usually about a 50 win team for the Timberwolves with KG. San Antonio Spurs. When they had David Robinson, probably less help around him. Those rosters were terrible in the 90s. About a 50-win team. Kareem in the 70s, when he didn't have much help at all. Around a 500 team. Early LeBron, 45 to 50 wins. 42, his sophomore season in the NBA. Michael Jordan, years three through six, similar range to LeBron. 
a really good one. Someone actually came to this one on Twitter before me. Dwayne Wade, the two years right before LeBron and Bosch came over. Dwayne Wade was about this range. Not a lot of help on the team. 43 wins and 47 wins. Consistently, you have a clear above 500 team that can get to 50. Now, they lost a lot. All those teams I just said were all like, well, are they really a superstar? They lose in the playoffs every single year. Like, this is not a playoffs team. You don't win the playoffs if you're a bottom 10 offense. But despite those blasphemies, and let me be clear, I'm not projecting Wembenyama. This is the player he has been already. This calendar year is that level of player by BPM. I'm just going by the numbers. That's what's there. So that's one projection. That puts them in the like 42 to 50 win range. Here's my other projection. This is my usual way of projecting. Now, admittedly, I'm kind of guessing a little bit on the number here, but the way I projected their team offensively and defensively, I have the Spurs as the number two defense. I have them as a top seven team that could finish number one. I have them 24th on offense. Now, you know, I do my player or my team similarities thing. It's really hard to find a team that's that good defensively and that mid slash bad defensively. You're going to laugh at the comps I came up with that this is the team I'm super in on. My favorite comp for this team is last year's Magic. Really good defense, terrible offense. Last year's Magic won a whole lot of regular season games. They were way better than a 35 and a half win team. The Cleveland Cavaliers from three years ago, a team that we have been betting on because of the formula. The Bulls a couple years ago. Hilariously, the 2021 Lakers, who by the way won a championship, they fit this profile too as an elite defense not good offense. Their offense obviously took a leap in the playoffs. Who knows? Maybe Wemmy could do that. So to me, those sort of teams are, again, high floor teams that win about 40 to 50 wins. I have them net plus two, 46 win team. I have them effectively equal to the Dallas Mavericks in the standings. I think they are a clear play in team. I think this number is way off. I think the market is where you're at. They don't know what to do with this. And I think the market is way underselling how good Weminyama is already. And Pop is 18 and 8 to the over. And this probably is my favorite over on the board. I get it. <clears throat> and it, it it makes a lot of sense from how you approach things, right? And I, I want to be swayed. <sighs> The bottom here is pretty is still really really low, um, and here's the other thing. I did a projection, so I have like my base power rating projection, which is just like, hey, overall, like how good are these teams? Okay, which is like that's very much built off of. It's similar. We have different approaches to how we get there, but that's like what you and I both do, right? It's like, okay, how good are these teams? Okay, and then we'll put them in comparison to each other. Um, I took it a step further, and what I did was I actually applied the power rating and then converted that to a spread line for every single game and converted that to a winning percentage. So, like, wow. okay, let's look at the actual schedule that they got to play because this is one of the key things here. And that's really where I think I run into, run into some problems here because, like, I've got the Spurs as um, projected right around this number, and then it goes lower when I do the actual schedule because they're going to play so many damn West teams. Like this is the issue is like San Antonio's average win percentage is going to have to be lower, even if they're better because they're facing the West. Like there's just not, there's not as many opportunities for them to win. And I think that that's like, that gets to be really difficult here with um, trying to figure out how they're going to find wins because you can't look back last year and find like a lot of, areas where you're like oh but they'll win these games like they were 10 and 15 versus teams under 500 last year um as a comparison like they were think about that number 10 and 15 they were five games under 500 versus teams under versus teams under 500 the portland trailblazers were 13 and 12 uh hmm. the memphis grizzlies were 12 and 14 and i don't have the numbers for what those were first half of the year versus second half of the year right what i do know is that if you look at it and you go like oh but like san, san antonio beat denver late in the year they can and I think that's absolutely true. Like, I think San Antonio is going to be a squad that might knock off anybody, anytime, anywhere. But winning in the regular season is largely about consistency. And the question is going to be, like, can they be consistent night to night to night with Chris Paul at age 39 
um, with ha- as many young players as they're still likely to play. All of those to me make me a little bit skeptical here of being all in on an over. Um, I want to ask you this question. You, you're all in on the over. You said with Memphis, you were playing median plays. Is this a, do you want tail end outcomes for San Antonio as well? I do. So here's the, here are the, here's my Wemby escalator season bets. And I want to add to, before I say those, okay. I, I think what's hard here for both of us, I think we agree on this is I, I think you're getting the night to night consistency in the regular season because of the defense. I think the defense is going to be so good because of what this entire thing for me is when Yama's defense breaks any way we have of understanding how good he is and how impactful he is. And that's it. That's the entire, like the whole thing is a bet on women. Yama's defensive impact. That is the night to night ceiling. Like if uh, the night to night floor, you talked about the, the under 500 teams, how would like last year's magic do against the under 500 teams? Isn't the whole point of that version of a team that they beat those under 500 teams because of the high floor in the defense. So instead of going 10 and 15, what if they go 20 and five, what if they go 18 and seven, that's the point to me is I think actually this is the formula that beats those teams with pop and CP and Wemby's defense and mostly just Wemby's defense. That is the formula that I'm going for here is occasionally Wemby does crazy stuff and you beat the nuggets, but mostly you just beat the bad teams because that's the thing we always say you win with defense and floor. And I just think we all know Wemby's really good defensively. I don't think we have a way like in our brains to measure how good and how impactful he is. Like the numbers I have him at where I'm looking and the way I'm projecting him is the all time great defensive player in NBA history. And I realize that's absurd, but that's the numbers that I'm seeing and looking at. So that's the, that's where I'm going. 40 plus wins is plus 220. I guess I didn't say my projection for them. I did. I add them at 46 wins. So 40 plus wins plus 220. Jeez. That's a full <laughs> unit play for me. Full <clears throat> unit. Cause I think that all my comps for this team had them at 500 or better. Play in is plus 350. 45 plus wins is plus 530. So between those two, I think I like the play in better. I think I have them pretty clearly in the range. I have them as the, where's my number here? I have them as the eight seed at 46. And I've got 9, 10, 11 is 43 to 41 wins. So I have them clear above that group into the play-in range. Uh, And just in case, my long tail outcome here, even though I talked about this, I didn't have it much in the division because I don't really know what to do with these teams. The division number is 28 to 1. That's implied about 3.5%. My numbers have the Spurs about 16% to win the division. I think the division is in play for this team. Now, look, I like Memphis. You like Dallas. We haven't talked about the Pelicans. The Rockets are good. All five of these teams could win the division, quite frankly. It's the only division, I think, ever. I don't think I've ever had a team where I had to, like, make real odds for all five teams. I don't think the Rockets are really, really in the mix. But, like, they all can do the thing. It's a numbers play. The Spurs, by the way I think about this team, should not be 28-1 to to win this division. I don't think there is a juggernaut team in the division that puts it in play. And I think the Spurs have as good of a chance to get to this division ceiling as anyone. So I will play the over. I will play 40 plus wins for a full unit. I will play the play in for plus 350. And I will play the division at 28 to 1. This is my like overest team of the NBA season. I'm just betting everything on Victor Wemanyama. Wow. Wow. Okay. Strong take from Brandon. That's his bet. Everything on the Spurs. Uh, let's go to a team I know that you have less to talk about. I have some stuff to say about them. Let's do the New Orleans Pelicans. What are your 10 words for the Pels? New Orleans Pelicans. I'm scrolling to my list here. Okay. Most confusing team in the league. No, thank you. I will pass on the under 46 and a half. All right. <clears throat> Mine is... I'm uncomfortable on this island over 45 and a half. (laughs) Um, I'm going to take a 28 to one quarter unit play on them for the one seed. That's how much I like the Pels. Um, Their win total is 45.9. There's some 46 and a half, 45 and a half. Actually not much movement 
there's just like a difference in the market depending on the book of where you want to get them at. Uh, seating, they're at seven and a half minus one hundred five to the over minus one fifteen to the under. So uh, that's where you're at for for uh, how they are. They have the eleventh toughest strength of schedule in the NBA this season. Um, give me the big picture on the Pels and what you like about them. Yeah, more than any other team in the league, to me, this feels like a roster in progress. This feels like an incomplete team. Like, we don't really know quite what we're cooking still yet. <laughs> you're watching a cooking show, and it cuts to commercial break, and you're like, what What are they doing over here? It's like chopped, and they got something happening over here. Something's in the stove. And they're like, I don't know what's happening over here. They consolidated for DeJounte Murray. They moved on from Jonas Valanciunas. Brandon Ingram's on an expiring deal. Nobody seems to want to trade for him, but they don't seem to want to give him the extension. CJ has got two years left. There's rumors about CJ getting traded. There's rumors about Ingram getting traded. I think that they have six really good starters. DeJounte, CJ McCollum, Brandon Ingram, Herb Jones, Trey Murphy, Zion Williamson. I want to start all six of those guys on certain versions of teams, but I only can start four of them because I still need a center. So I don't really know what I do. I'm like, what what in the world roster am I building here? There isn't a center. They drafted Eve Misi. They have Daniel Tice. That's the centers. So is Zion the center? And what in the world is our defense now? I don't know what happens with the team. There's interesting players. It seems like either Ingram or McCollum is going to go at some point, probably for a startable center in some depth. I think I'd really like the team, actually, then. I think I'm really intrigued by what that team is. If they made me the GM of the team, I could make one move, just one trade. I'd be like, all right, I see the one seed, Matt. Let's do the one seed. Let's let's do the thing. Like, I'm close. This is a team I have my eye on. What I like, I think CJ's been awesome with the Pelicans. He's like a 25-5 on near 60% true shooting, and he's been really good for them. I love Trey Murphy. My numbers rate Trey Murphy right now similar to J-Dub. Like, that's really good. That is a, my, he's my eighth team forward in the NBA. I think he's the second best player on this team. He cannot come off the bench. They have to have more Trey Murphy. I love Zion. He's not quite the thing I wanted him to become, but he's really good. I love the pesky defenders, Herb Jones, Trey Murphy, Jose Alvarado, now DeJounte, and I think a better role for him. A lineup where I could start DeJounte, and Herb Jones, and Trey and Zion with a center, and bring CJ off the bench for some scoring, and punt Brandon Ingram to wherever I had to get rid of him to bring in the center. Ooh, I like that. That's like a 50-win team. I like the defense, build around Zion. i kind of intrigued by that. And of course, I don't really get it, but I like Willie Green. I know you don't really like him that much. That's ironically the one thing I like about the team is Top seven defense, two years in a row, featuring McCollum and Ingram and Zion and Valanciunas. I don't know what the heck you're doing. Like, they get a lot of turnovers. They rebound defensively. They allow a ton of threes, but nobody ever makes them because there's some black magic thing happening. I don't really get it, but it works. We had two years of it now. That's what I like about the Pelicans. What do you like? So uh, let's start with the number. I actually want to go to the number part here because I think it's important. Uh, last season, so again, the win total is 46 and a half. Last season, they won 49 games. They had the sixth best net rating schedule adjusted in the NBA, and they won 49 games. Their Pythagorean expected, which we've talked a lot about how those can be kind of tricky, 51.8, 52. And we know that win totals are, are typically there's a stronger correlation with the Pythagorean, what you're expected to have done than the actual. And yet this number not only moves backwards, but they moves backwards from both numbers dramatically. We're talking about a six win differential here from the Pythagorean. There's six wins worse than their Pythagorean last year. And again, a lot of the data I have suggests that when you get up into, especially with the high ones, not 46 and a half, but when you get up to like 52 and a half and they won more games than they should have, that's good. And when you win fewer games, it's actually like a negative kind of, kind of sign. Um, so for me, I like, I just start from this position of, okay, they, they trade for DeJounte Murray and they have a glut and they have a center problem. That's six wins worse. Than, than Pythagorean expected and three wins worse than actual. 
So the number starting off point, I think, is is really kind of difficult. Uh, Zion was a plus last year defensively. They figured out how to defend with Zion on the floor, and that's a huge kind of uh, impact there. Uh, he was 75th percentile defensively in terms of EPM on court. Uh, plus 1.6 on offense, that's 87th percentile. Same stuff. You surround him with shooters, and they absolutely crush. Um, 64% at the rim, that's just 57th percentile, but... His assist percentage was crazy, 87th percentile at 26%. Zion's a monster as an engine. When you surround him with good players, Zion as point forward still is an absolute truck. Uh, they were also really good with Zion on the bench. They were actually plus 3.7 better when Zion was, was not on the floor last season, in part because they were playing JV so much and they did not know what to do with Jose, Al- with not Jose Alvarado, but Jonas Valanciunas. Like by mid season, Willie Green didn't want to play him, but they couldn't find a way to uh, somebody to trade for him. So they were starting him and then benching him, even in matchups where they needed the size. This is yet another reason why I'm not a huge fan of Willie Green. Uh, Jose Alvarado is quite frankly, he is probably the most impactful bench player in the league. Not the best. Doesn't mean you should win six man of the year. But if we're looking at these kind of things, they were plus 12 on court Alvarado. Um, losing Najee Marshall matters. That that does matter. Um, but they have so many lineups that are absolutely great. I love the DeJounte Murray lineup addition. I'm still in on DeJounte. I think most people are out on him after the Atlanta thing, but we have to go back to kind of who he was in San Antonio and his objective value. There's also value in DeJounte versus CJ. So if CJ goes to the bench and you're now at DeJounte Murray, Herb Jones, Trey Murphy, Trey Murphy uh, Zion, and then whatever winds up at center, that lineup still makes to me a lot more sense than having CJ out there. And then there's Brandon Ingram thrown in there as well. So if you play Zion small ball, you can also also go that route as well. Zion should be able to play a little bit more center this year just as he gets older. Um, those are some of the reasons of why I really like them. The defense is, it was really good. There's some numbers that kind of indicate why that was smoke and mirrors. That's fair. There's also upside here in that Brandon Ingram did not report to a voluntary workout with players in California. They are still at a standstill over his extension. <clears throat> if they extend him, I will be disappointed and probably not as enthusiastic about this bet. If they trade him for anything, and I'm not saying that, that Brandon Ingram's not worth anything. I just want the, it's not that I don't like Brandon Ingram, although I'm not crazy about his game. It's that what they unlock if they deal Brandon Ingram is so much more interesting and compelling. And if they find any sort of center answer as part of that, oof, look out. Uh, Alvarado and CJ as a balance, that lineup makes an incredible amount of sense. They had a 126 offensive rating with CJ McCollum next to Jose Alvarado with a 115 defensive rating. The 115 is not great, but it's really good when you're scoring 126 for 100 because you have CJ's scoring and balance and Alvarado's ability to make plays defensively and zip. It really does work. The combination of Alvarado, DeJounte Murray, even though his defensive numbers were terrible last year, but Alvarado, DeJounte, Trey, and Herb, when those four guys are on the floor without Ingram or Zion, those teams are going to kill defensively. Like, that's just so much great perimeter defense. Um, So all those things are are kind of what I like about them. What don't you like about the Pels? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot of the things we've talked about already. I I just, I, it's a lot more what don't I understand about the Pelicans and what don't I like. I I don't understand the defense. I don't understand how you build a defense with this roster with, with really zero rim protection on the team. Uh, Zion probably is going to have to play some center minutes, which probably is going to work offensively, but I don't know how that goes defensively. I mean, I, I feel like I do know how that goes defensively, not well. They lost Najee Marshall. They lost Larry Lance Jr. They lost Dyson Daniels. Uh, that's a lot of defense to lose. So they've, they've got plenty of guys, but I don't know how the defense works, but I don't really know how the defense worked the last two years, and somehow that worked also. So I don't know what to do with that. I don't like that Zion Williamson's rim percentage uh, offensively has dropped each season in the NBA. I don't like that uh, the, the, the type of player he is, the, the body that he has, that's a worrying direction for me that he like, that's what makes him so unstoppable. And so unique is just the wrecking ball to the rim. I I, I worry that we might've seen the best of Zion. I, I worry that we've kind of maxed out and we might be slowly moving the wrong direction. And I really, really want to be wrong about that. Like this is one of my favorite prospects I've ever evaluated. I would love to sound uh, clip me into oblivion. I'd love to be wrong. 
I just am a little worried about that. That was the upside for the team to me. You mentioned the Pythagorean expected wins. They've been under their expected wins by like two to four wins, all three of the Willie Green years. So I think that's a thing. Like usually that tends to line up if that's the case where like we see certain players tend to go over that or certain coaches do. Something about like the smoke and mirrors thing we think we're seeing maybe is playing out though. I don't really know. It's again, it's another thing I don't know. And then just my projections, this is going to sound like a totally useless projection, which is the point. It is. It's why I'm not betting this team. I have the Pelicans offensively somewhere between eighth and 20th in the NBA. Great. Super helpful. Somewhere between half the teams in the league. That's the range I've given them. I put them 14th. So right in the middle defensively, add them somewhere between eighth and 18th. Super useful, giant swath of range. So there's kind of average offensively, average defensively, but not really. They might be really good on both of those. They might be really bad on both of those. It ends up giving me a win range projection of anywhere from 39 to 53 wins. I can't do anything with that. When I was supposed to bet a team that I have them anywhere from like the 10 seed to the three seed. I got nothing for that. So I guess what I had to say is this. This is a team that last year, I said, you got to bet the team because you got to play the long tail outcomes. This certainly is not a median team. Do not play median outcomes for them. I think you have to bet if you're going to play them something of a long tail. Uh, My last comment for you is this. I'm a little concerned. You have correctly, I have learned over the years, kind of admonished me for, okay, You don't get to project what the front office should do and what the lineup is going to be. That's not how the NBA works. It only is what we have in front of us right now. I don't know that I feel confident betting on a Brandon Ingram trade to get the right center to come on in. Like, there's not necessarily a lot of perfect fits next to Zion. There's certain guys I like. Like, I'd love to have seen Miles Turner on this team. But I don't know that that deal is out there for him. Ingram's a hard guy to fit into your incoming team. I don't feel comfortable projecting the trade and guessing what the team is. And you know, I've bet on teams that version where I've been like, I think there's a move coming. I think there's a thing coming here. I don't, I don't know if I do on this team. It's too unpredictable for me. And I don't know if I can get there. Yeah, I think part of the part of the issue is that I can't deny that, that Ingram was part of their success last year because Ingram really kind of developed as a passer last year in ways that I was really impressed with. Ingram still bullheaded and still plays too much. Like um, he he and DeRozan have a lot of similarities in that I do what I do and I am what I am and I'm a hooper and this is who I am, and that caused a lot of issues. And like, look, I think there's been, <clears throat> I think. I think there's been a lot of different feelings about Ingram and they're very mixed and I'm not sure they know what to do with the situation. He's too good to just move off of. He's not good enough to get the return that they need. They're navigating the cap and the luxury tax in a very, very small market with very strong restrictions. All of those things I think are, are important kind of things to to mention here. I understand that. I think that skepticism is warranted. Did you think, what if I told you that Brandon Ingram was DeMar DeRozan? What if that's the career that he's on? How do you feel about that comp? Not not like the exact same player, but just like that sort of guy yeah. where it's like, you're good. You're like probably a Hall of Famer. You made the all-star teams. Yep. You got all the points. Like, is that what yep. Brandon Ingram is going to be? Is like the floor raiser that needs to be the star on not a great team, but we don't really know what great team you're supposed to be on? There, There's so many comparisons there. Um Everyone loves DeMar in the locker room and everyone loves Ingram in the locker room. Like Ingram's very popular with coaches and the locker room in New Orleans from everything I've been told. And so like, I think that's a lot of it is like, there is, there are, there's value to the Pels that goes beyond the on-court stuff. It's just like the problem for the rest of us is we, we see what he is holding them back from unlocking. And that to me is like something that they're going to have to figure out. Um, so yeah, I think you're right that you shouldn't expect there to be trades. Like if they just go through the season like this, what does this look like? And if you're just, if you get to the end of it and you're just like, they don't have a center, Matt, they have no center. (laughs) There's no center. So if there's no center, what are they going to do? Fair. I think it's fair. Uh, but I'm betting the upside on the new Orleans Pelicans. Let's wrap up your bet on this team. Uh, I'm taking the over 45 and a half and I'm doing, doing a little, little bit on the one seed 28 to one. 
Okay. Uh, let's take the Houston Rockets to wrap up. What's your 10 words on the Houston Rockets? Give me Rockets futures, but like long-term futures under 43 and a half and a pass. Uh, mine is love the team, hate the spot. I'm going to stay away from this one as well. Uh, in the market, 42 and a half flat across the board. I project them at around 40. Uh, I've actually got some numbers. My schedule adjusted numbers are considerably lower on that end um, because of the impact of, you know, the Western Conference being mm-hmm. a factor in, in all these types of things. I've actually got them um, at 41 is where I actually wind up there um, after a little bit of a, of a bump off of that 39.6. I gave them more of a bump for internal improvement. Um, the Rockets are in a tough spot from like all sorts of, like they're in the, that middle spot trying to make hay and find their way, uh, throughout that tough Western conference seating over eight and a half. The over is minus 135 under plus 110. If you want to get in on the playoffs, the Houston Rockets come in, in the market at one book I'm seeing, uh, at yes, plus 120, no, minus 145. To participate in the Western Conference plan, they are the favorite to participate in the plan at plus 125. Give me the big picture and what you like about the Rockets. Yeah, they they uh, this is the first podcast that we've ever been on on the season preview where I'm going to say good things about the Rockets. This has been one of the teams I <laughs> first podcast we do under on the Rockets. Like that's been my go-to move for years. They, they beat the expectations. They made me lose money last year. They jumped from 17 to 20 to 22 wins, and then 41. That was a ginormous jump. And while doing it, they locked into a number three pick that they weren't supposed to get. That was a pick they traded to Oklahoma City, and it ended up being top four protected, and the protections work. And now they got Reed Shepard, who was my number one player in the draft. They get a free number one player in a bad draft, but Reed Shepard is pretty good. That they lucked into him despite being a 500 team. They returned the entire top 12 in minutes played on the team. So we have a deep roster. You got a lot of young guys, lots of upside on the team. It came together quickly. It is the last year contract right now of both Shane Goon and Jalen Green. And I think that's interesting because it sort of feels like they're going to pick one, but not both. I don't really know. It's not a team I've been able to get a great read on, but I'm a little worried if you don't know which one of those dudes you're picking. I know darn well which dude I'm picking, and it's Alpern Shangoon. It's very, very easy. I think he's underrated and one of the best young players in the league. I I feel like that's the clear direction where the team should be going. Fred Van Vliet is effectively in his last year, I think, on the deal also, probably with where they're going to end up going. I think this is a transitional year for the team, more than a breakout year. This is a figure-it-out year. Who are we going to be? There's too many guys, actually, here. They need to figure out where they're going, what are they going to do, They've got youth, they've got draft picks, they've got cap room, they've got flexibility. There are options here. This is not the final version of who the Rockets are going to be. It's not even close to it. So I think that the Rockets are moving in the right direction. The stuff that we talked about with the Spurs about that you had to bump them down because of the schedule and just where things are at. I think this is the version of that. We're just like, yeah, man, like if this team was in the East, I'd be like, great under six and a half on the playoff seed. Like, let's get above the play. And I, I love this team. I like it in the East. I, I'm sorry, you play in the West. That's where we're at right now. So what I like about the team, they, they've been elite drafting and developing youth since the Stepien guys went over there. So that, that that's the draft guys. Uh, my draft Nick presence online. Like those are the guys that have been so good for them. So I love the young guys, Shane Goon, 21, 10 and five. I thought he was my most improved player last season. Points, assists, usage went up. He went from being whatever he was defensively to anchoring a top 10 defense. Center still anchored defense. He was that good last year. I thought Jabari Smith improved a lot last year, pretty quietly, offense and defense. I think he's maybe kind of back on that Jaron Jackson Jr. track. Amen Thompson, stud numbers defensively. As a rookie, you're not supposed to be able to do that. Not much offense. We'll see how it goes. I like him. I like Fred Van Vliet. Always very good and underrated. I think he's the perfect successor plan to Reed Shepard. I think probably this is the year that we kind of move that direction. A very similar stylistic player. Steven Adams, they got. Tari Eason, Cam Whitmore, AJ Griffin, if he can still remember how to shoot. Like, this is good dudes on this team. And I like Ime Odoka, who I thought did an incredible job on this team last year to get the defense 
this defense with this group of young dudes who didn't make sense to me jumped from 29th to 9th. That's what I got way wrong about this team last year. And I knew that they're going to move the floor up. I moved them up to like 20th or 22nd. They were top 12 in all four factories except for EFG. So he's got them playing hard. I can't fade this team because they're going to show up and fight every night and they got young dudes and they're going to play hard in defense. Their bench defense, if you got Reed Shepard, Amon Thompson, Tar Easton, and Steven Adams, like that could be nasty. That's a nasty defensive second unit to come in and just throw at teams. I like the team. I really want to be in on the team. I just feel like the number is a little high and it's it's the wrong spot and the wrong year. It's probably I might yeah. on them next year, I guess. Yeah. Um, the floor, I think, defensively is very high because of Udoka and the personnel that they've got. Uh, so th- they're going to be pretty good defensively. The internal improvement here, if you want like the reason to go over, it's that, like, look, if Shangun makes another jump, this probably goes over. If Jalen Green finally figures out his career and what he needs to be and it clicks for him, this team probably goes over. If Jabari Smith lives up to his billing when he was projected to be a number one pick until the very day of the draft, this team probably goes over. If Cam Whitmore makes a leap and he's the one that pops, if it's Reed Shepard and he's the one that's like, he earns a starting spot over Jalen Green and his rookie of the year, they probably go over. If Amon Thompson makes a jump in playmaking and is able to be become more of a uh, well-rounded player, not just defense, defense and passing, and he's like really is like a versatile engine for this team, they go over. Any of their guys pop, and it goes over. But I just don't know if that's going to happen, especially, like you said, versus what is a really tough, tough um, schedule. Uh, I to put that in perspective, because of who they face at home, I actually have them projected to be sub five hundred at home, which is not going to happen. They'll win their home games, but that's how they have a tougher home schedule than road schedule, and it's really tough. They have one of the toughest road or home schedules I've got in the NBA right now. Um, <clears throat> on top of that, um, I did want to kind of note this that we talked about the Pythagorean stuff. I did look up this number, so they have the highest differential between how many they actually won and what they should have last year. They won five fewer games than they should have last year based off a point differential. Now, some of that's like they would have games where they won huge. Like they beat Denver by like double digits multiple times. So some of it's messy, but based off of a pretty stable metric, they, they won five fewer games. So I wanted to see like, what's that tail end? Because that's 90th percentile is what we're talking about. Like that's 95th percentile. I looked at if you won four or fewer games than you should have the prior season. Those teams are 17 and 11 to the over in the last 13 seasons. It's not a huge gap. It's not a huge sample, but it's enough for me to be like, there is kind of a trend that even though I've kind of talked about how if you win fewer, it's not always a good sign. If you win way fewer, yeah, there's a little bit of expected regression once we get into these kind of tail end performances there. Um, On the other end of that, I actually have an article coming out on Action Network that talks about um, when you win your three-point games, which are basically coin flips. They went eight and five, 62%. Teams in that spot do tend to go under the following season. I I think I'm going to be on this team on a night-to-night basis. I just don't necessarily – I'm not compelled to bet them on a win-total basis or bet them play-in, playoffs, et cetera. They're – like, I think play-in probably is pretty good value, even at the shortest number on the board at plus 125. Like, do I see them as top six? I do not. Do I see them as uh, 11th or worst? No. Like, even if guys got hurt, I wouldn't imagine them there. So I think plus 125 would be my best bet if I had one on the Rockets. Uh, what I don't like about the Rockets, I was really hoping you were going to ask me so I could just respond, Dylan Brooks and Jalen Green. That's what I don't like about the team. I like yeah. the version of this team that I imagine a couple of years from now, they brought in Dylan and Fred Van Vliet for the transitional period they're in. Like These are not long-term guys on the roster. They are doing exactly what they're supposed to to get them a mindset and a defensive mindset and move to the new era of the young guys. I think a couple of years from now, I think that Freddie and Dylan, and I think Jalen Green are off the team. And I like the future version of this team a lot. I like where they're going. If you if you told me I could bet like top six seed next season, give me the odds on that. I'll, I'll get my ticket right now. Like I literally said, I want futures on the team in future years. We just can't actually do that yet. Books, you know, I, I'll, 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 I'll log in and bet. I'll give you my action. If you let me bet multiple years down the road on things, you can have my money and keep it for years. Then I'll win it back with extra stuff. I don't like the offense. The offense, EFG was 27th last year. That's not great. That's that's not great. There's not a lot of offense on this team. So I'm a little worried that on the profile, 
that there was just a lot of low hanging fruit on this team from Steven Silas. And I think credit Udoka for grabbing the fruit and getting it. And they figured a lot of stuff out, but I think they could probably surprise some teams. I think they, I think they've made most of the improvements that was sitting out there for them to get credit for doing that. I just don't know if there's another leap coming there. So I end up having them 20th offense, 10th defense, which sort of makes them to me similar to like a worse Orlando magic in a much better conference. So I have a hard time getting there to where you're at on the play in a thing, because let's do this to, to, Miss the play-in. I agree. They're not going to be a top six seed. They, they, I'm not going to count on that. So seven, eight, nine, ten is the play-in. So Matt Moore, who are the ten? Give me five West teams that you think are going to finish below the Rockets. I'll start. I'm going to give you Portland and Utah. That's two. Who are your other three that are definitely below Houston? Portland and Utah. Um, <clears throat> I will go Golden State Warriors. Um, no, I'm just kidding. May, am I? Um, I'm not sure you're kidding. I was counting I, on that being one of the three. <laughs> uh, I will go. All right, this is a good point here. Go Clippers. I'll go Clippers. Yeah, I'll give you the Clippers. They're they're one of mine. Um, and the last one I will get to is see for that's like the wild card is the one there where it's like some team has a year from hell. And just no, like you're only at three, map. though. You're counting that's the like, Warriors that's... as the fourth the year from hell. Are you pick, picking two years from hell? Could happen. This is the problem. Like, I, I have them. I've got Pelicans 43, yeah. Kings 42, Rockets 41 is my 9, 10, 11 seed. So I have the Rockets as a 500 team, exactly what they were last year, but an 11 seed. I have four teams below them. I have Portland, Utah, Clippers. And oh, I, got I have the Lakers I have San Antonio. Them. Oh, yeah, I have sand. That's no, you're right. You I do. Have you have them, though. Oh, all right. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So, like, for me, it's, yeah. That, yeah, that, I think that, that, you're right. The, the, the Spurs that's, are the Warriors, presumed Clippers, team Spurs. that's going to be down in that group for most people that, for me, are just totally missing out of that right. tier. So that's probably a big swing. Nonetheless, yeah. I, I would caution against betting this team as effectively a coin flip to make the play-in. The West is just so good, man. It's so good. So I think they will. Okay. Because I think the bottom will drop on a couple of teams, and I think the defense and the depth will provide a floor for this team that makes the play-in. I hope they do. I'd love to see the Houston Rockets make the play-in. That would be awesome. I want to watch this team. I want to root for this team. I haven't said any stuff like this about the Rockets for many years. Rockets fans, I'm ready. I'm on board. I just can't bet it yet this year. All right, that's got to do it for Buckets. Thanks for joining us. Make sure to check out all the great stuff at youtube.com slash the action network. My thanks to David Payne and the video crew for getting up this very long episode over at our various platforms. Make sure to download the action network app, follow Brandon for all of those picks coming in for NFL and NBA season. We'll have these picks up in the action network app as well. We'll be back next week as we start awards conversation. Make sure to tune in for that. We'll see you guys again next time. Till then, let's get Buckets. 